All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ashwin Prabhu. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this evening's event on behalf of Tamil Heritage Trust. As you all know, we are gathered here today for a very special reason, a reason which brings us together once every year, a chance to witness the award ceremony of the Tamil Heritage Trust, Professor S. Swaminathan Heritage Award. In its third year now, the THT Professor S. Swaminathan Heritage Award has come to be recognized as an important effort to encourage early and impactful work in the field of heritage studies, awareness, and communication. But before we go on to the award part, I would like to take a few minutes, as has been our custom, and start by introducing Tamil Heritage Trust to any new friends we have today here in the audience. For those of you who have been with us for some time now, this will serve as a reintroduction. The Tamil Heritage Trust was founded in the year 2010 as a voluntary, non-profit organization with the express objective of helping the general public understand, appreciate, and celebrate India's rich and unique heritage and history. To this end, it has undertaken several initiatives, like its much appreciated monthly lectures by speakers from all across the country, its annual Pecha Kacheri, quite literally, quite literally, a splendid thematic concert of talk, talks, its site seminar, where a study group travels to a place of historical interest and engages in a deep and immersive learning experience. The Indology Festival, which brings together experts in the field onto a common conference platform. It's fun and informative workshops like How's That? How to See a Temple and How Sam? How to See a Museum. The new Alamaravai, a learning network for teachers and the newly launched V. Venkaya Epigraphy Award, which debuted this year. As I'm sure you'll agree, the Trust has its hands full with all of these initiatives, and we're always looking for volunteers to help us. So if you're interested in contributing to the work we do, please write to us and let us know. Now, coming to the centerpiece agenda for the day, the Tamil Heritage Trust, Professor S. Swaminathan Heritage Award. We first felt the need for an award of this nature three years back when we were looking for ways to recognize high quality work in the heritage space. But we're also wondering about how we could ignite this field with motivation and resources to do more. This decision to create an award for an individual under 50 years of age who has contributed in an exceptional manner to understanding, dissemination and the preservation of heritage is an outcome of that deliberation. There are several well-endowed institutional efforts underway in the field of heritage today, and that's a very significant movement. But at the same time, there are also numerous well-intentioned, perseverant, scholastic, and enterprising individuals out there today who've made heritage studies and communication their life's work. Our intention is to recognize, honor, and encourage such individuals, and this annual award is one way of doing that. The award in its first year went to the dynamic Madhusudan Kalai Chalvan and to the erudite Dr. G. Shankar Narayanan last year. We're gathered here today, of course, to honor the recipient in this award's third year. The award itself, as some of you may know, is named for the moving force behind the founding of the Tamil Heritage Trust, Professor S. Swaminathan who's been kind enough to grace the occasion today. He continues to motivate us, challenge us, and also enlarge our vision for Tamil Heritage Trust. And we owe an unpayable debt of gratitude for his leadership and counsel. Thank you, sir. We invited nominations for the award this year in late June, early July, and we were thrilled to receive several high quality nominations from across the country. The August jury panel this year consisted of people we look up to and learn from at Tamil, at Tamil Heritage Trust. The jury consisted of Dr. Sanjay Garg, officer on special duty with the Ministry of Culture, Government of India, and also an ASI veteran. Dr. Kumit Kanitkar, independent researcher and acclaimed author of a monograph on the Ambarnath Temple. Shri P. L. Uday Kumar, founder of Inscription Stones of Bangalore 
and Shri R. Kannan, co-founder of THT and board member of Natya Rangam, Naradagana Sabha. These jury members spent abundant time going through each nomination individually before preparing their notes and coming together for a joint discussion. At the end of the discussion, the decision of the panel was clear. The winner of this year's Tamil Heritage Trust, Professor S. Swaminathan Heritage Award is Shri Pradeep Chakravarti. <laughs> Pradeep Chakravarti was born in Palim Kote in 1975. He studied in The School KFI, Madras Christian College, where he won the best outgoing student of the department, JNU, where he was a recipient of the Ford Foundation Scholarship, and the London School of Economics. He has just submitted his PhD with the Madras University on the social, cultural, and economic life of the Pandyas as seen from their stone inscriptions. Pradeep's purpose is to draw insights from history on human thought and behavior relevant for adults and children for their lives today. After an illustrious career in TVS, Cognizant, Infosys, and McKinsey, he has been able to marry personal passion and profession by conducting workshops based on lessons from history. Pradeep has eight books to his credit, the latest being Leadership Shastra and a co-translation of select, select essays of Yuve Samanadarayar. A book on South Indian history for children is in the works. Earlier books include Temples of Tamil Nadu, Tanjavur, and Temple Vahanas. He has several articles in leading magazines and newspapers to his credit. Pradeep has partnered um, in creating almost 20 tours to different districts of Tamil Nadu to showcase the heritage and crafts of that region. He's also curated exhibitions in the IIC Delhi and is a regular speaker on pre-colonial Tamil history. He's also in the process of opening, very interestingly, the first heritage hotel of Tirunelveli Tutikaran district to showcase the rich culture of that geographical region. Pradeep is formally associated with the Saraswati Mahal Library in Tanjavur and Dakshina Chitra. What remains now as the last part of my most pleasant duty today is to now invite Professor S. Swaminathan to address the audience and then hand over the citation and award to Pradeep. After which, Pradeep will speak on some aspects of Pandya society between 600 CE and 1300 CE with a specific focus on trade, commerce and women. Professor. எல்லோருக்கும் வணக்கம் பிரதீப்பை பற்றி எல்லோரும் இதை அஸ்வின் ரொம்ப அழகாக சொன்னோம் இட்ஸ் அ மல்டி ஃபேசட்டட் பர்சனாலிட்டி ரொம்ப ஈஸியாக பழகிறதுக்கு உள்ள ஒரு ஆள் இந்த அக்காம்ப்ளிஷ்மெண்ட்லாம் இருந்தாலே நம்ம கிட்டக்க போகிறதுக்கு கொஞ்சம் பயப்படுவோம் அந்த மாதிரி இல்லாமல் இன்னொன்று முக்கியமானது என்னென்னா இஸ் இன்ட்ரெஸ்டிங் எக்ஸாம்பிள் டு ஃபாலோ அவனோட பயோடேட்டா படித்தாங்க அவனு சொன்னால் தப்பிச்சுக்காது தப்பு இல்லைப்பா வயசு எனக்கு ஒன்று இருக்கு இல்லையா பயோடேட்டா படித்து படிக்கும்போது முதல்ல வந்து தி ஸ்கூலு அதுக்கப்புறம் வந்து ஜேஎன்யூ அதுக்கப்புறம் லண்டன் ஸ்கூல் ஆஃப் எக்கனாமிக்ஸ் அவங்களோட நம்ம வந்து உடனே நம்ம ஹெரிட்டேஜ் வாக்க பாளையம் கோட்டையில் ஹெரிட்டேஜ் ஹோட்டல்லாம் நம்ம நார்மலி கனெக்ட் பண்ண முடியாது நெக்ஸ்ட் திங் இஸ் வேலை பார்த்ததும் பார்த்தீங்கன்னா மக்கன்சி மாதிரி இன்ஃபோசிஸ் மக்கன்சி மாதிரி நார்மலி இந்த மாதிரியான ஒரு பர்சனல் பர்சனாலிட்டியை வந்து நம்ம வந்து ஹெரிட்டேஜோட இது பண்ணல இதை கனெக்ட் பண்ண முடியாது பட் ஹி ஹஸ் நாட் ஒன்லி கனெக்டட் ஹி ஹஸ் டன் அன் எக்ஸலண்ட் ஜாப் இந்த இந்த மாதிரியான வேலைகள் வந்து முதல்ல வந்து நமக்கு ஆர்வம் இருக்கிறங்கிறது ஒன்றும் ஆனால் அது ஐடியாவும் போகணும் என்ன நிறைய விஷயம் இதை பிரதீப் பண்ணது வந்து இதுக்கு முன்னாடி ஒருத்தரும் இந்த ஊரில் அட்டன் பண்ண அட்டன் பண்ணலன்னு நான் நினைக்கிறேன் நான் ஸோ இந்த ஹி டிசர்வ்ஸ் இஸ் த மோஸ்ட் அண்ட் ஐ விஷ் யூம் ஆல் த பெஸ்ட் அண்ட் இன் ஃபியூச்சர் திஸ் ஒன் அண்ட் தமிழ் ஹெரிட்டேஜ் இன்ட்ரெஸ்ட் வில் ஆல்வேஸ் பி வித் ஹிம் in his further endeavors thank you sir 
Um, it gives me great pleasure to announce that the Tamil Heritage Trust Professor S. Swaminathan Heritage Award 2022 is awarded to Sri Pradeep Chakravarti in recognition of his exceptional contribution towards the understanding, dissemination and preservation of India's heritage through initiatives that encourage the interest and involvement of the public, thereby raising the awareness and appreciation of India's rich history, arts, literature and culture. honored to give this talk today. Uh, Tamil Heritage Trust is, uh, has been a very important inspiration for me in many ways. Uh, just last week uh, from uh, my tour group we completed a wonderful tour to Arni and the genesis of that Arni tour was a Tamil Heritage Trust lecture that was organized. So the trust does more than organize lectures, it actually propels people like me to show those regions to different parts of uh, different people. Um, I thought it's appropriate, Malaya Masam uh, Malaya has just passed, this is the time when we fulfill our uh, Rina to Pitrus, I thought it's appropriate in this time to start with uh, a few words of gratitude to people who have supported me in this journey. Um, I could not have started on this journey of epigraphs without uh, Maxia Gandhi, Madam and uh, Mr. Shivanandam who are both of the state ASI uh, department. They are the ones who actually told me what an epigraph was and I am very, uh, very, very grateful to them. Uh, also to uh, the late uh, Sendhil sir, who is also a part of the ASI, who really taught me the value of field work. There is not one temple or one historical monument in the Tutukudi, Kanyakumari, Tut uh, Thinaveli districts that he wouldn't have seen. And I really regret him not being here with me today. Uh, Dr. Santalingam has also been a very towering support for me. I'm, I've called him at all kinds of odd hours, asking for explanations on some epigraphs, especially during my PhD thesis, and never flinched. And I think one thing that's common with all these people that I've worked with in the ASI is they have never uh, not shared their wisdom with me. And I think if, if, I, if there's one thing that I need to learn and I constantly remember about them is always share whatever I know to whoever asks, whenever they ask. I think that's been an enormous inspiration from all of them. Um, the Hindu and the TAG Foundation are the ones who started me on this journey of speaking in podiums and getting me to write. So I have my, my uh, thanks are due to them. Uh, Tirathangam Tainatasa has been a great help to me in the past in terms of connecting me to relevant people and getting me information access as well. Uh, and I cannot uh, forget uh, the role of Haikal and Vinod Dasari because they were the first two people who helped me uh, really connect heritage to uh, business life, professional life. Uh, the heritage tour that I did for their team or themselves in Kudumiyamale, uh, which is I think a place very close to uh, Professor Swaminathan's heart, it really opened my eyes that this concept can work. That if, if we ask the right kind of questions, history can be connected to people who work, who have no interest in history, and it can also be connected to children. Last but not the least, uh, I cannot not f uh, forget to thank uh, people from the Mystical Palmyra group, Priyati Agrajan, Krishnan Ankal, Nityanti, so many of you are here today and it really, it means a lot to me because uh, if it weren't for the tours, uh, I wouldn't have realized that history is not just about learning some knowledge, but it can also be used to build communities and Arni I think was my 21st or 20th tour and if they've been so successful, it's only been because of all these people who've also taught me 
that uh, beyond history there is a community and, and the way that we connect with each other is just as important. Uh, lastly and um, in, in no way the least, people like Vijay, Gopu, um, Sundar, uh, Ashok, Shankar and all of these people are those who help me very frequently with photographs. Uh, most of you who know me well will know that I am very very handicapped when it comes to taking photos for my own PPTs. These are people I have troubled at all kinds of odd hours and they have also helped me and I thought this was a good opportunity for me to thank Thank you to get me to do those PPTs the way I need to do that so that these kind of messages can go on to children and to others as well. Um, with those few words, I thought I should start uh, my, my talk. Um, I just want to figure out, yeah, I think that might be better, yeah. Um, so I'm going to do, my talk is going to be on, on the role of women in the Pandya inscriptions and on trade and commerce as well. We'll see how time goes. Uh, Ashwin, uh, yeah, you're here. Okay. So just give me a heads up at about 20 minutes when I have uh, just about 20 minutes left. Yeah. Right. Um, my initial impulse was to do a more conversational talk on Maharvarman Sundra Pandya and my favorite Pandya king. But I thought given the scholarship and the depth of knowledge that the THT people have, I should do something a little bit more serious and a lot more academic. So here goes. Uh, the three famous dynasties, namely the Cheras, the Cholas and the Pandyas, ruled over South India. Among them, the Pandyas were the oldest ruling dynasty with a nearly continuous history from the early Sangam age to the 17th century. Their antiquity has been proven by various sources, particularly by Sangam literature and by authentic epigraphical records right from the Ashoka period. The four boundaries of the Pandya Nada or the Pandya country are defined in an ancient poem. The poem reveals that the northern boundary of the Pandya country was Vellar or Shweta Nadi, which lies between Shivaganga and Pudukote. The western boundary was open landmass, the southern boundary was Kanyakumari and the eastern coast was the eastern boundary, the Bay of Bengal. Manika Vasagar, who, uh, who lived during the 9th century, uh, mentions the boundary of the Pandya country or the area of the Pandya country as Pandya Nadu Parampati, which means that the Pandya country, even at his time, was alone seen as a very ancient landmass. Uh, districts in the modern Tamil Nadu such as Madurai, Ramanathapuram, Shivagangai, Theni, Dindukal, Virudhanagar, Tutukudi, Tirunalveli, Kanyakumari and some parts of Pudukote, especially Tirumayam, Punnamaravati and Avriyar Koyal Taluks are all part of the ancient Pandya country. The main river sources of the Pandya country was the Vaigai near Madurai and the Tambra Parni in the Tirunalveli district. The Vaigai originates in Veli Malai uh, near the Varshanada hill range and joins the Bay of Bengal at uh, Arangare near Ramana. The Tambrapatni originates in the Podige Hills near Papanasam and flows through the hillocks of Kuttalam and drains into the Bay of Bengal near Kayal near Tirchandur. The Tambrapatni is a perennial river which flows through the Tirnal Valley and Tutukudi districts of today. The etymology of the word Pandya is probably Pandu. Pandu which means ancient. Uh, hence the people who lived in this region are also called the Pandyas. The Pandyas and their capital city Madurai was known, well known to the ancient Greeks and the Romans. The account of Megasthenes, the Greek ambassador of Seleucus in the court of the Chandragupta Maurya 320 BCE refers to the South, South India Kingdom and also is, is mentioned in the other classical uh, writings of the West. A Pandya king sent an embassy to the Roman Emperor Augustus in about 20, 25 BCE. Pliny as the elder in about 75 CE, the Roman philosopher and author, mentions Madurai as the capital city of the Pandyas and refers to it as a Mediterranean emporium, meaning that whatever was sold in the, in the luxury trade of Mediterranean actually came from the Pandya country. Uh, Ashoka's rock edict is the first epigraphical reference that we have to the pa Tamil kings of the Pandyas. The earliest epigraph referred to Madurai and the Pandya kings is near Madurai. There are Tamil Brahmi script and dated to about 300 BCE to 200 BCE. The Alhar Malay Kidari Patti record and the Metu Patti record furnish the name Madurai. Madurai is the word that is used at that time. Uh, this name, um, the name of a Sangam Pandya king, Nedinjayan, is also found in one of the Tamil Brahmi epigraphs in Mangulam near Madurai, which is datable to about 300 BCE. The traditional epithets of the Pandya, such as Varudi, Cheriyan, are mentioned in the epigraphs of Mangulam and uh, Arita Patti. The Pandian reign can be divided in and studied under the four different periods as follows. 
you have the sangam period pandyas which are from about 300 bce to uh, 300 ce you have the early pandyas from 550 ce to 1000 ce the later pandyas from about 1100 1190 ce to 1300 ce and the tengasi pandyas from about 1450 ce to 1700 ce i think the problem with the pandyas has been we've have a lot of inscriptions but many pandyas number one use the same name so it's very difficult to find out which pandya that inscription is talking about and the second is given the harsh environment of, that they rule it's very likely that many of the pandyas were actually ruling um at coeval times so some times it's very difficult to find out whether this pandya was ruling only in tengasi only in madurai the name is confusing the geographical dist- uh, the area is also confusing which is probably why a great scholar like uh, k neelakanta shastri who was born in kaladakurchi which is pa- spot bang in the middle of the pandya country chose to focus on the cholas i know he wrote a book on the pandyas as well but that's more of an afterthought we all remember him for his chola book and it's sadly why we don't have even one authoritative uh, comprehensive history of the pandya political history at all we don't have even one and to the best of my understanding the social cultural history my thesis will probably be the first Uh, the topic of the paper today um, is some aspects of trade and commerce and the role of women they're not connected i had to bring a connection together in the pandya country as gleaned from epigraphs from the 4th to the 14th century navaratri time i thought i'll start with the women first um in sangam times it's very likely going by literary evidence men and women enjoyed equal status as providers and in their interactions with the family and in society women's work and their contribution to the family were the same as tho- those of men and therefore they were regarded as equal in status and value in due course of time women's role as progenitors in the family began to be recognized as an additional qualification for their attaining superior status over men so even in the time of uva saminada ayer uh the dowry was not the way we pay today the uh, the groom paid the bride a, a, a dowry even in, in in as late as the 19th century as a result of this development of the social evolution women became the sole property owners a right which was willingly accepted by the men again in course of time especially during the late medieval period changes in social evolution hijacked the women's status as property owners and men began to dominate therefore women had to play a secondary role and serve the interests of men The situation of women in Tamil Nadu is unique. There is no evidence of educational institutions specially meant for women, but they got knowledge through their foster mothers and there were more than 50 women poets in the Sangam literature. Avyar of course being the famous one, Kake Padaniyar, Ponmudiyar being some of the Kaveri Pedu are some of the other names. Um An early Tamil Brahmi epigraph in Aragar Malay mentions uh, Sapamita, a Jain nun, who was as one of the donors. This was a period when Jainism flourished and was patronized by kings and traders and trade guilds or nigama. Um, during this period, women uh, women too could opt for the life of a of a re- renunciate and make donations to construct a, a Jain rock bed. During the Bhakti movement, Mangayar Karasi, the queen of Arikesari Nedumaran, a strong Shaivite and Andal, the 8th century Sri Vaishnava Alwar, were well educated and were empowered enough to involve themselves in religious activities in the Pandya country. Contribution of the royal women as seen from epigraphs. During the early Pandya period, royal women enjoyed considerable freedom and were wealthy enough to contribute to temple development and culture and sometimes even build their own temples. At the Tiruparangundram Cave Temple, shrines for Jeshta Devi, that's Mu Devi, and Durga were constructed by Nakkan Kori, the wife of the then military general uh, the wife of the gen military general satam ganapati who hailed from um, kalakudi uh, uh, or ugrangote uh, parantaka veeranarayana pandya who ruled from about 860 to 905 ce has constructed a structural temple for jaina religion in his wife's name vanavan madevi and named it madevi perumballi pallina is usually a jain temple um, usually queens in both the pandya and chola dynasties were named as uraham ulagam urudayal as avani murudayal and uh, uh, bhuvana murudayal and nokama devi meaning the possessor of the whole world these queens also contributed generously to the development of religion and culture during the chola rule in the pandya country the queens of rajendra chola the first odia pirati and ulagodayal donated several eternal lamps to the ugiran kote and sheranma devi temples the village sheranma devi itself is named after a uh, uh, pandya queen 
in the Kanyakumari Bhagavati temple, an eternal lamp was donated by Mukkullin Adigal, the queen of Sundara Chola Pandya, um, Atichi Mahadevi, the queen of the Chera King Rajasinga Deva, donated an eternal lamp at Manar Koil Vishnu temple. During the 29th regional year of Srivallabha Pandya, from about 11, 10, 1101 to 1124, his queen, Ulaha constructed the temple kitchen or the Tirumadapalli. The same queen also donated to the Agastishwaram temple in Kanyakumari district. Avani Murdudayal, the queen of Kulashekara Pandya, donated about 60 Choya Narkas or Chola coins for the expenses of the Shivaratri festival in Tirupattur, Tirukailayana, Tirthali Nadar temple. A Shaiva Mata by the name, uh, a Shaiva Mata named after Nambirati was constituted by the aunt of Kulashekara Pandya, Tirunal Veli, for the benefit of pilgrims travelling long distances. Veera Choli Alvar, the mother of Maravanman Sundara Pandya, donated lands for the Tirthali temple at Tirumangalam Taluk in Madure district. During the 21st regional year of the rule of Sadean Maran in the 10th century, a person named Kadam donated something, we are not sure what it is, the epigraph is a little damaged, on the behalf of his lover Narche Nukki for the Vishnu temple in Kovikulam village. In another epigraph in the same village, it is learned that Narche Nukki was the woman Kadam was in love with and she had donated an eternal lamp in, for him and also 25 sheep to the same temple be lovely to write some kind of a fiction out of this. During the period of King Sade and Maran, the queen of a chieftain, Satra Bayankara Mutta, Mutta, Muttaraya, sorry, uh, called Anukkan Appi Nangai, offered 25 sheep for the lamp uh, uh, to Vishnu temple in Tenthirmalur in Jole in Sevalapperi. Uh, during the Chola rule in the Pandya region around the 11th century, Aryam Poduvi, the wife of a Pallavaraya chief, donated an eternal lamp and also donated 25 coins to the Kuttalam temple for the maintenance of the lamp. Um, Sadagopan Thirumangai Andal, the wife of a Kalingaraya chief during the days of Jatavarman Kulashekara, had installed the Sri Devi and Bhumi Devi images in the temple at Tirthangal. She not only installed the icons but also donated certain lands for the expenses of the dresses, daily expenses associated with the deities. Women servants who ranked lowest in the work hierarchy were also, who, who were also part of the royal entourage of the women of the royal household were known as Anikki Parivara Pen or Velat Pendati. Also, they also gave donations to the temple. A woman royal helper also served in the palace of Sadevarman Kulashekara and she installed an image of Thirunyana Samandar in the Shiva temple within the Thirukoshtur Vishnu temple. <coughs> Chokanada Achyar, an image of Chokanada Achyar was uh, installed in the Karivalam Vanda Nallur by a woman, a royal helper uh, called Akka Parivaram, who served in the royal palace. Uh, Kariva, um, this village, Karivalam Vanda Nallur, is somewhere near uh, Tengasi. Um, where was I? Mumbadi Choli, alias uh, Mangayar Karasi of Tiruvadavur, installed images of the Rudra Deva or Shiva and his two consorts. She also constructed a main road around the temple and relayed the cut stones in the inner bank of an irrigation tank, which was an enormous, uh, enormously important act for the community. Um, in, in recognition of her charitable work, she was rewarded with water rights to her lands and hence it's obvious that women had involved themselves wholeheartedly in temple donations and welfare activities of the temple. Now, what I've read to you is just a long, long, it looks like a laundry list, but the inference that we need to make, number one is um, women had the right to give these gifts because they were on their own they were on their own uh, authority because if they gave it through a man that man's name would have been mentioned the fact that no man's name is mentioned means that they were allowed to give these gifts on their own number two uh, when when a gift is given to a temple it is that woman's way of contributing to the welfare of a much larger community because when this lamp is given i think all of you know this when the lamp is given there is interest that is given or the in the form of coins or in the form of land and the rest of the and the lamp needs very little income for for it to light but all the rest of the money goes to the other uh, activities of the temple in terms of feeding people in terms of sponsoring festivals etc so it, it this one small lamp means that there's an enormous social contribution that that person is giving to the larger community. Women in Jainism. In the Pandya region, Jainism survived even after the Bhakti movement and it still survives. 
women were allowed to become nuns and they were also involved themselves in charitable activities they had installed some images of tirthankaras in some important jain centers during the 9th and the 10th century achanadi was a very well known jain monk his name is inscribed in many of the important jain centers around madurai his mother gunamati was instrumental in commissioning a mahavira bar relief in the kirkuyil kodi jain hill which you can still see even today kalgamale which is now in thootukudi district was a very large jain residential school during the 9th 10th century several women teachers who were called kurathi and women steeders who were called manakkai stayed there and some of them have installed a mahavira bas relief on the hill chitra lalayas uh, tiruchcharan tiruchcharant malai is one of the most fascinating monuments in in the well i i would think in tamil nadu but definitely in that region is another important jain center in southern tamil nadu near marthandam in kanyakumari district it's a tough climb but well worth it in this place kurandaki uh, kurathikal was a woman student of arittanemi pattarar and she donated 10 kalanjas of gold to the bhagavathi temple of uh, tiruchcharanam hill during the rule of vikramaditya varaguna around the 10th century so 10 kalanjas of gold is an enormous amount of money even by today's standards yeah. devaradiyar in the hindu temples 16 kinds of offerings or the shodasha upachara are important the, and uh, among these 16 music and dance are the final and the most important offerings separate groups of musicians and dancers were appointed for this purpose and they were paid by cash or land in exchange for their services these dancers were known as devaradiyar kanikayar pattiliyar taliyilar rishapattiliyar talicheri pendagal manikkam and ruddha kanikar so we just know these names today but it is very likely that each of them had very specific roles otherwise you wouldn't have had such specific names for them these devaradiyar in the course of time turned into devadasis or women dedicated to the deity of a temple among religious literature the agamas bear direct evidence to the devadasi system in the medieval period it's a pan indian custom that existed in all hindu temples both shaivite and vaishnavite The term Devaradiyar means servant or of the deva or the deity of the temple. Devaradiyar also included men and women. Uh, while men were engaged in musical discourses or mu- musical training, not to an hour, I think of today's understanding, the women were the dancers. Women not only danced but also cleaned and decorated the temple premises. One, an interesting inscription, not from the from the Pandya region, but during the Chola period of rule of the Pandyas, in Manar Koil tells you what are the jobs that the women had to do and how much they were paid for this in Paddy. Um, these dancers were well versed in dancing and on the basis of their skill they were honored with titles like Thalai Kolli and Kavidi. These Devaradiyas were wealthy enough because of their service and received generous donations from kings and nobles. They used their wealth for development activities of the temples and therefore the villages. Donating icons, bronze images, lighting eternal lamps and helping villages when, when, uh, when there were emergencies. Now, very important to note that at a time when the right, uh, the pro- prosperity of a woman or the rights of a woman were dependent on the man. So, for example, if land had to be bought or sold, the woman would have to do it on through a man in her family but the devaradiya didn't have that role they could donate land or they could dispose of their income in any way that they wanted so it may seem like a a a, a class of women who were um, not empowered but if you read between the lines and read the lines carefully they were actually very very well empowered and we'll see a little bit more about them as far as the pandya country is concerned the devaradiyar served in temples since the 9th 10th century the first reference of a devaradiyar is from tirunelveli during the time of the pandya king maranjadeyan maranjadeyan is also the person who wrote out the manur record which talks about how the judicial and the election systems change because of the ownership of the property in that village changes um so uh, where 12 cows were donated and uh, to light an eternal lamp at the shiva temple for the well being of the devaradiyar satan deyam during the 10th century the term devaradiyar has a prefix nakkan which is the name of shiva hence a devaradiyar who served in a shiva temple had that prefix even in a relatively smaller temple like the sundara pandya pallipada temple in pallimadam which is a tomb temple given to the heterodox uh, sects of shaivism or the Ilak, the pashupatas or the kala mukas um, th- even they had uh, and they had very esoteric very different rituals compared to what shaiva siddhanta would uh, would uh, would uh, demand even they had a devaradiyar in that uh, in that temple in the palimadam temple from epigraphs one learns that they were known variously as devan karatta chilai sorry i am sorry Yeah. <clears throat> 
from the epigraphs on the palimadam temple we know that they were called as devan karutha chile kavidi kanni pare nandi sadayam pidari and nakan kulavilange kulavilai um, they were honored with the title kavidi uh, also devaradiyars were married and had children on behalf of her daughter uh, devaradiyar donated a lamp weighing 50 palam which is about 3.5 kg and 50 sheep for lighting the lamp at the shivagiri temple during the reign of shrivallabha pandya more than one devaradiyar was conferred the title talekolli and served in the kaliyar koil so if you want to learn one of the one of the temples with the maximum number of inscriptions on devaradiyar is the kaliyar kovil devaradiyar was also known as the padiliyar pati here could mean either a husband or a native place the term the uh, talilar is also found here which means the absence of temple attachment hence patilar and talilar have different meanings the names of these devaradiyars were served who served in the kaliyar koil are talilar nakkan seyal alayas kalingaraya talaikolli nakkan nachiyar alayas taniya aniya um, tani aaneetta perumal talaikolli and patilar nakkan nallur al, uh, nallar alayas uh, muvayarath talaikolli so we just know these names but there would have been a lot of uh, minute differences in their role and their status but uh, unfortunately through an epigraph we can't make those out and um, there is no literature around this also so at this moment we could we just stuck with names titles and some sense of what they could have done um eight devaradiyas live in the same side of the temple street this is in tiruparangundram subramanya temple uh, and uh, many of them were called manikams or manikathal which is a very well known reference to a devaradiyar literally means like they were a gem in the temple they were that precious to the temple um if any dispute arose between the devaradiyas and administrators they were amicably settled and adequate and appropriate services were ensured and this is one of the one of the most severe disputes in a village because if the devaradiyar did not complete the shodasha upachara the temple Uh, rituals would stop if the temple ritual stopped the whole society came to a halt so they would post haste they would uh, not not like today where you know you make an apply application and court and it takes his own sweet time it never happened within within hours if not days these kind of disputes would be sorted out and of course one of the most famous ones is in our own good old tiruvottur so frustratingly this one is not as elaborate as the tiruvottur inscription but we know that they were there was a dispute resolution mechanism and they were there like any other human they also had their own fights between themselves um at the idak uh, idakattur shiva temple there is one such dispute that uh, disrupted the continuous services of devaradiyar during the reign of sadayavarman sundara pandyar which is 1250 to 1253 devadasi such as uh, kutukkatal alagiyal alayas alagiya pandya manikam uh, purappane manikam vadivade manikam attended the meeting convened by the temple administrators of the shri rudra maheshwaras and the sthanikas the requirements of the devaradiyas were requ- addressed and their continuous service was thus ensured so we don't know much about what happened in the dispute but we know that it was resolved to their satisfaction devaradiyas were completely depended upon the temple for their livelihood however as many of them had earned enough money to, for basic needs and comforts they donated their surplus resources to temples one had built a whole temple with her wealth others donated bronze images to be consecrated in temples some of them helped the village in an emergency um as validated by epigraphs which show their gel- generous and philanthropic activities M- most if not all of these situations where they helped was around what the village needed the most which was irrigation facilities and regular cleaning of the and upkeep of the tank bund and the tanks and the canals devaradiyal nachi the daughter of uh, durgayandi during the 21st regional year of jatavarman veera pandya built an amman shrine uh, called aruludai malar mangai amman in kudumiyamale in pudukote district administrators of this temple faced with shortage of money tried to sell the village lands for the improvement of this temple however within 2 years the same devaradiyar gave 73300 cars and purchased the land so must be in copper coins but still a large quantity at that time the tenkare moolananda swami temple uh, in the in the 13th century uh, devaradiyar donated a padman uh, prabha mandala or a metal aureole for the bronze image of nataraja her name is mentioned in the record as udaya nachi daughter of kallichi some devaradiyar collectively constructed the northern enclosure wall of the temple in tenkare the names of the devaradiyar who constructed this wall are engraved in the wall itself as ariya nachi daughter of udaya nachi punyaki alias nastakalliya manikam and a balipitam was also constructed by devaradiyar in kadayanallur at tirupattur tiruthalinada uh, temple a devaradiyar donated a large bronze image of nataraja 
ஆரம்பிக்கிறேன் important temples the shiva temple kailashnatha temple in brahmadesam uh, the shiva temple at tiruvalliswaram and the uh, gopala swami temple in manar koil these temples have some information and rec- um, some inscriptions on the devaradiyar uh, but we do have some references in the ayagar koil to devaradiyar ayagar koil dasi abirama valli is men- inscribed in the temples of shivali puttur and tirukkarangudi tirukkarangudi in the later pandya period during 1600 c so at there was a point of time when um, when the ayagar image was moved to tirukurungudi and even today there is a region or there's a small plot over there called the ayagar koil uh, for safe keeping because of the invasions and it was a devaradiyar who actually looked after and maintained that shrine How are we doing on time ashwin all right I've about half an hour so I'll, i'll go through some aspects of trade and commerce i've split it into two parts first part is about a lot of mention i mean of course the maximum number of uh, trade related inscriptions are in the pandya region because it was the pandya region which was really contributing to the gdp of tamil nadu at that time because of their trade connections yeah the pearls the textiles and they were closer to the to kerala so the the port cities went back and forth so there's a lot of respect uh, a lot of uh, references to the uh, trade guilds i'll talk a little bit about that and then we'll see uh, some mention of the highway network system that the traders use will look at can i have a glass of water thank you in the pandya region the trading communities had prospered since the sangam period the barter system was in vogue in tamil nadu and we have several references to this from sangam literature nellum muppum neere uyirir which means one unit of uh, paddy equaled one unit of salt in those day, in the barter economy um, paddy and salt were exchanged for equal value and madurai had markets both by day and night and that were very very busy early epigraphs from kidari patti mention traders living there madurai uppu vanigan kollu vanigan panida vanigan aruvai vanigan are all mentioned collectively in one place according to shri airavata mahadevan these epigraphs date back to about 1st century ce and they correspond to the sangam age the mangalam tamil brahmi inscription mentions the word nigama which means a guild any of you here who have an account with bsnl bharat sanchar nigam right the original word is niyama nigama yeah um vellarai nigamam is mentioned in two instances this word later becomes niyamam or niyamam so they even today there are villages in that region called niyamam thank you Foreign trade with Greece also flourished. The discovery of Roman coins in places like Uttamapuram in uh, Kambam near Madurai, Alangulam, uh, Karivalam Vandanallur and other places show Roman trade occurred uh, till the 4th 5th century CE. And we found a lot of Roman pottery as well. Ports in the Bay of Bengal such as Korkai, Alangulam, Tondi, Periyapatnam, Kayal Patnam, Veerapandian Patnam, Kulushekara Patnam and the recently discovered Irukandurai served in this trade with West, East and Sri Lanka. Trade guilds in Tamil Nadu are first noticed in the Pandya country. Various trade guilds such as Ainuravar, Nana Desi, Padinan Vishayam, Tisayayarath Ainuravar, uh, Valangayar, Manigramam, Anjuvannam are all known from epigraphs. The term guild immediately conjures up an image of an association of professionals with a well-defined structure, a carefully framed code of conduct of rules and membership governed by certain regulations and qualifications. Um, it's interesting, any of the inscriptions on trade guilds the emphasis is on their duty to their community rather than the rights they can expect from the community so very interesting point consistently you will see this the first guild named ainuravar uh, um, uh, appears in the munisanda inscription in pudukote district from 927 ce the guild first appears in aihole village in bijapur district in karnataka around the middle of the 8th century aihole was probably an agrahara and, and it was most likely that the guild ayavole or aihole uh, ayavole uh, ainur was founded by a group of brahmin mahajanas from aihole so we had a long trade connection with karnataka it mentions the constituent groups so that's a large guild within that guild they had sub guilds so this could have either been based on 
products that were traded or it could be in terms of caste or community we can see both of these kind and maybe there was a combination there may be other ways of de describing it but we are not sure from whatever we have inscriptions definitely caste base is there product base is there um, it mentions constituent groups namely chetti chetti putra uh, Kavaravai etc as having 500 charters or Veerasasanas and their crest being adorned by Lakshmi. They are said to have descended from Vasudeva, Kandali and Mula Padra as the sons of Parameshwari and as having transactions in 18 Patnams, 32 Velapurams and 64 Kadigai Tavalam. Just remember these words, I will explain these a little later. Um, the same eulogy is found in Samudra Patti and Nattam epigraphs. In this epigraph, some groups of people are mentioned. Among them Chetti, the head trader. The term is corrupted from the uh, Sanskrit word Shreshti. Chetti Putran means son of a Chetti, but he is a subordinate of a Chetti like a servant. Kavare means another group of Chetti engaged in a particular business. The Brahmin organization established in Aihole in the 8th century may have been controlled or at least involved in commercial activities. But the reason why the later merchants both in Karnataka and Tamil Nadu claim their connections is not known. Various guilds are mentioned in the records. Among them, Ainuravar are the 500 members descended from the Aihole group. Nana the ACs are merchants from all four directions. Padin Visayam means members from 18 different Nadas or regions. Uh, the term Vishayam or Bhumi in Sanskrit means Nada in Tamil. Ainuravar and Padin and Vishayam are synonyms. Manigramam is another group of merchants who appear in epigraphs from about 9th century CE. This term has its equivalent in Kannada as Balinja. Uh, Disay Ayrath Ainuravar were a mercantile group made of thousand directions of the world. Anjuvannam was a foreign, were foreign traders, mostly Muslims, who had the habit of worshipping five times daily. Anju. Yep. This term Anjuvannam is found only in Tamil Nadu and Kerala and with the help of a literary work called Palasandha Male, we can conclude that they were also called Yavanar and Sonakar who are said to be followers of Kulapati, Kalupati or Khalifa and worshippers of Allah. In the eulogy of Ainuruvar, um, the other terms such as Padanittu Patnam, Irvati, uh, Mupati Randa Velupuram and 64 Kadigai Tavalam are all to be discussed. Pattinam is a seaport but Patnam is an inland town or a nagaram. Uh, Velupuram or Valarpuram are commercial centers which spread all over Tamil Nadu. The suffix Puram denotes the mercantile centers Velapuram and Kadigai Tavalam is a highway in. Traders who travel long along the long highways along their with their chat or goods on donkeys or horses for a long distance trade rested in these Tavalam. Even today in that region, there are villages like um, Velan Tavalam, Vembadi Tavalam in the Coimbatore, especially in the Coimbatore Palakkad Road, because that Palakkad Pass was how you entered Kerala the easiest way, which is where a lot of the trade to all the trade to the west happened. Uh, Chetis. The members of the guilds are uh, generally known as Chettis and their servants called Chetti Putran. Chettis are named according to their trade. They are called Chetti, Sileti, Dhamma Chetti, Dhana Chetti, Kudre Chetti, Silai Chetti, Tammatta Valar, so on. Besides them, there are other traders like Shankara Pandyar or oil merchants. Shekhar, which are oil press owners, the, uh, are also mentioned. Sheila Chetti or Sila Chetti may be cloth merchants, Sila being a sari. They are otherwise known as Aruvai Vanigar. They even initiated temple constructions or repairs as seen in an epigraph on a door jamb in Irakandurai. Kudre Chetti. Horses for the army were since ancient times imported from Arabia into the Pandya region. Kail, Patnam and Tondi were two seaports in the sea coast that did brisk business on this. Shaiva Saint Manikavasagar, the minister of Aragona II, 9th to 10th century CE, was sent to the east coast for purchasing horses from Kudre Chettis. They are mentioned in the records as Malay Mandalat Kudre Chetti. Malay Mandala means Kerala. Uh, and one Kudre Chetti has, has, was referred to as a landowner in the Maramangalam temple during the 13th century. There were oil merchants or Shankara Pandyar who were uh, to supply oil for routine temple worship. These presses were sometimes drawn on wheels. Shankar Padi were where they lived and in course of time became Shankar Padi or Shankara Padiyar, plural. During the period of Sundara Chola Pandya, one, uh, one member of this community provided oil for a perpetual lamp at the Shiva temple of Atanur. Uh, another one called Manabarana Vaikuntha Nadalvan took the responsibility to supply oil to light a perpetual lamp at the Tirvali Swaram temple near Brahmadesam. So the minute we see this word Nadalvan, then there is a chance that they had administrative responsibilities also. So by inference, not 100% sure, but the hypothesis is there is a chance that then this community was also allowed to be represented in the local government of the region, which we would normally think were only for the Brahmins. 
Um, ya. Yeah. Uh, Shankara Pandey had also lived in Suttamalli Perundaru in Tirunelveli town and engaged in manufacturing oil with a press. This street is also known as Vaniyar street and the land endowed by them is known as Sakara Pandeyar Patr Dhamma Chetti. In the epigraphs of Ainurar we find two phrases um Taval Tirutth Dhanmai Valarkum Chetti and Chamai Ainodum Kuranai Eith Samai Thanmai Inid Nadath the dharma chetti dhamma and samayam are synonyms they mean people were virtuous ethical and just and they are settled in or near thavalams which are the highway inns the piranmala epigraph mentions how merchants engaged uh, special security staff to protect them and their goods there were about 12 categories according to this epigraph and uh, there were ondiral veerar who are trained heroes or uh, guards uh, panishai makkal which are menial workers associated with them and the, the other 12 categories are uh, eri veerar jayapalar kai kollar kongalvar kotkudi panmar muni veerar pavade veeran pavade here is probably cloth so somebody who protected cloth mahavetukal uh, ilanjingam veerakodiyar valviran angaharam these were all paid by the guild and they had to be with the traders always as their caravans went back and forth in the category of vole veeran so this was a separate this all what i mentioned now were military support apart from this there were vole veeran who included writers brokers and running messengers these are all the different so you get some sense of how these caravans started how much of how many people went along with them uh, manigrama another group of merchant guild is known as manigrama originally the vanika gramam the first epigraphical evidence for manigrama is available in kollam in kerala which denotes a connection between christians who were migrants and the local authority during the 9th 10th century another ancient manigramam record has been noticed as takupa in thailand which belongs to the period of nandivarma pallava malla the second from 715 to 780 it records the digging of a tank called sri avani uh, avani naranam by the chief of nangur and the placing of it under the protection of the manigramathar in the pandya region this guild was probably in kodumbalur near tiruchirappalli and was once the capital of the erikavela chiefs in the pandya region six locations have epigraphs uh, on them they are kutralam tittandapuram piranmalai shivapuri nattam and melamangalam they seem to have had two important hometowns oreyur and kodumbalur the latter during the che- the days of parandaka chola the first in about 928 ce have been mentioned in the kutralam epigraphs a uh, dhamma chetti sadayan kavare kavayan a member of the manigramam donated 26 cows for the supply of ghee to light a perpetual lamp at shivapuri tantonri surar temple one member of the kodumbalur manigramam arasa mathale kuttan alaya shivakamalayan uh siva Kar- karnalayan sorry donated some land for the expenses of daily morning food offerings in this record the merchant is mentioned by the name vyapari in the piranmal epigraph of 1250 ce we have various nagarathars uh, assembled to take a decision to the donations of the piranmal shiva temple in the kodumbalur manigrama the 1269 epigraph of tittanda puram and ramanadar puram district mentions the manigrama members collaboration with kaikollas doing some trade based on cotton with sri lanka and the anjuvanna in the tamil uh, country in the 13th century the manigramam were associated with the distribution of commodities of internal and overseas trade kodumbalur village served as a strong base for their activities in the piranmala inscription the assembly of nagarams and manigramams convened to fix the taxes on important export commodities the commodities enumerated are myro balan which i think is kodukapuli iron cotton cotton yarn thick and fine cotton fabric wax honey sandalwood wood silks rose water yak steel civet oil horses and elephants according to the tamil epigraphs on manigramam they seem to have focused on major trade routes within the control of the ayavol ainuruvar merchants the valangiyar the valangiyar and vivalangiyar also n- denote the n- same Aya- ainuruvar organization but the emphasis on these terms is probably because of their militant character the first reference about the valangiyar appears in the munisanda epigraph near pudukote district during the 20th regional year of parantaka the first in this epigraph the valangiyar guild is mentioned in association of the ainuravar and in some references we hear of a guild in sri lanka as well in the arupukota epigraphs um, one of the one of the valangiyar um, traders has installed a few deities in the shiva temple during the reign of maravarman sundara pandya the first uh, perinuravar 
the nirav uh, niravir or the peru niravir is an ancient group of merchants very rarely found in pandya inscriptions we don't know much about them we just know that they were there anjuvannam this is a maritime trade guild in the medieval pandya period the term is only found in kerala and tamil nadu sadashiva pandarathar mentions them first references to them in epigraphs are found in several west and east coast towns in the pandya region the epigraphs in tiruttandapuram talks of a big assembly consisting of several merchant groups and weavers namely manigramam samanda pandasali toyavirata chetti valanjiyar of south ilangai tenilangai kaikolar tusuvar vaniyar and nindra nindra kaiyar 500 var and this is around 500 var 500 var seems to be have composed of brahmins slowly other trading groups also began to get included including other castes as well the piranmalai epigraph mentions the bhumi putras and the chitrameli natar both agricultural communities the ainurvar were later known as the desai ayirath ainurvar meaning people from a thousand directions clearly it started off as a small organization that rapidly grew into a supra national uh, body nigamam uh, or nagaram sorry nagaram means a town where a large group of people live in urban life however it has a special meaning in the context of the nagaratar who engaged in business nagaratar male is also known in pudukote district as narthamale in the chola epigraphs this village is also called telinga kula kalapuram epigraphs reveal a complex society in the pandya region and by the 8th century the brahmadeya which is brahmin the ur which is the vellala agricultural area were joined by the nagaram or the traders the nagaram becomes a generic name for the trading chettiar communities and continues to be so the residents of nagarams were called nagaratar but this term nagaratar at present means only the chettiars but in the early period that's about 804 ce uh, brahmins who were in trade were also called nagaratar an epigraph in kalgamale mentions a brahmin from tiruchulil called shankaranarayana nagaratar and how he donated gold for 20 sheep to supply ghee to light a lamp a tiruchandur a nagaratar resident of uh, manavira patnam has donated 120 coins for the expense of a food offering to lord subramanya nagaratar thus made individual donations as well she had individual donations and you had uh, donations to the guild also during the 11th and 12th century ce many nagarams were created because of the increase of trade activities the whole country was divided into valanadu and nadu each nadu consisted of about 5 to 6 villages among them a nagaram also was established for example the following nagar can be known from the nadas kerala singa valanat arvina nagaram alayas kulasekara pattandat nagaratvam so there are quite a few like this i don't want to go into all of them there are about six of them um all these all these nagarams um functioned as one group in their respective nadas within the time demanded they also assembled together in piranmalai to discuss and decide on important issues so they clearly there was a lot of communication and coordination between all of them pattinam patnam means a sea port for example kaveri pombatnam nagapatnam periyapatnam ekave etc uh, kaveri pombatnam of course is an entry point acting as a collection center epigraphs of guilds refer to the area of their operation covering padinettu patnam or 18 patnams 32 valarpurams and 64 kadige tavalam patnam was undoubtedly a town of considerable importance valarpuram could perhaps be a growing trade center whereas a tavalam would have been seen to represent a fair or a or a place where there were warehouses um we cannot list the 18 patnams though they are still part of traditional proverbs uh, in the 12th century 13th century more patnams are noticed in the pandya epigraphs um there's a whole lot of them i'm not going to go to them uh, but clearly trade in the 12th uh, 13th century sea trade had become very very active otherwise you wouldn't need so many extra patnams uh, erivira dalam or erivira patnam Erivira sir or Munivira were armed guards associated with merchants. Dalam means a protected place or a center. Erivira Dalam means a center protected by Erivira. Erivira Patnam was more in the nature of a protected town for stocking merchandise and could have well been distribution points protected collectively by the merchant bodies. Um we're not very clear where these Erivira Patnams were protected or how they were protected must have had defensive walls and a lot of soldiers. Uh, for evidence of these settlements would merely indicate the presence of military groups of the merchant bodies in the pandya country tiruvalliswaram acquired the status of an erivira patnam where the shiva temple was entrusted to the care of the chola army called the moondrake mahasena 
In the Pandya country, such an Erivira Patnam was found in Natham, Samutra Patti, Athur, Periyakulam, Idaivalli, Thiruvalli Suram, Sirumalai, Malapatti and etc. These towns are all located in the main highways linking the other important kingdoms. Eripada Nallur was the place where the armed heroes lived. In the Pandya region, Periyakulam, Natham are known as Eripada Nallur. They were also called Erivira Talam and were protected by the armed heroes called the Veerakkodiyar. One was located in Athur near uh, Siddhayankote. Periyakulam, located in the present Thani district, was once called Eripadai Nallur and it then became Erivira Patnam called Alangulam uh, or Desi er Erivira Patnam. Patna Sami. Patna Sami means a leader or a head of a Patnam. In Karnataka, the administration of the Patnam was created, carried on by the Patna Swami or the Lord of the town with the help of the merchant bodies and the other non-commercial groups. In Tamil Nadu, there were heads of towns who presided over or participated in the meetings of the merchant bodies and other local groups. References to Patna Swami were the members of the Padinan Visaya, uh, Visaya, Visaya Guild um, levying cesses on merchandise is mentioned in the Piranmala epigraphs. In Erikanthurai, a water tank is also called Patna Swami Kulam in an epigraph from the reign of Kulothunga Chola I. There was also a local levy in the name of uh, Mahanmai who was collected by the merchants themselves. Perangadi or Perundar. During the 10th century in the Pandya region, individual establishments of big supermarkets were called Perangadi, Peria Angadi. The earliest Perangadi was in uh, Karavandan Puram, which is in Ugarankote, and was established by King Rajasimha III during the 10th century and called it Rajasinga Perundar and arranged soldiers to protect it. It was later expanded, and many such establishments are found in epigraphs. A recent survey establishes estimates the Pandya country having about 37 Perundara or marketplaces from about the 10th century to the 13th century. Suttamali Perundara near Tirunalveli, Kulashekaran Perundara near Surangudi, Rajayendra Choran Perundara near Ambasamudram are some of the Perundara found in the southern region. In Arupakote, at one town alone, four Perundara existed Srivallava Perundara, Veerapandi Perundara, Vikramapandi Perundara, and uh, Palivilangi Perundara. It appears that these were formed as business increased and they were usually named after the king. At Arita Patti, a Perundara functioned with the name of Padir, uh, Padirikudi alias Ainurava Perundara, Peruvali or Highways. Highways to link important towns and cities are first mentioned in the epic Silapadigaram. It mentions roads that link Madurai and Kodumbalur. Among these, the central road is called Madurai Peruvali. These highways were useful to move goods and merchandise and had resting places called Tavalam or Adi, um, Adikilatam. Um, yeah. Thiruvaranguruchi, Piran Malay, Punnamaravati, Thirukoshtiyur, Thirumalai, Thirutandapuram, Devi Patnam, Athur, Kannarpatti, Sindhavanur, Marandai and Angam, uh, Angamangulam are all some of the villages that were linked by these highways because we have inscriptions from there or mentioning those places. Proper protection was provided for the travellers who use these highways. On the Chola, Kula, Chola Kulandaka Peruvadi, uh, uh, a traveller once was attacked by a tiger but was saved by a guard, a Veera Kodiyar. And in this effort, the guard lost his life. The Nagaratar of this place endowed lands for, uh, to, for his sacrifice to the family. Therefore, we know that there were guards who were in these areas. Madigai. Madi means rolled goods or folded goods. Usually cloth goods were called Madi. So the storing place for such goods is called Madigai. Later it became Malikai and Mandi. It can also be known as Pandaga Sale or a Godown. These Madigais were located on the link roads between two major regions. Veerapandi and Madigai at uh, Angamangalam near Tirchandur, Kulushekar and Madigai at Niyamam near Tirpatur. Sri, uh, Sri Vallaban Madigai at Madurai, Padinen Vesayam Madigai at Ponnavaravati, Melur Kulushekar and Madigai at Panangadi are some of the Madigai centers mentioned in pa Pandya epigraphs. Guards or security forces. I think we are doing good on time, I hope. Uh, for long distance travel, the merchants had appointed security guards for their protection and safeguarding their goods. Epigraphs mention various different kinds of security guards. Some of them are Veera Kodiyar, uh, Porkodi Veera, uh, Mune Veera, Yeri Veera, Ilanjingam, Chetti Makkal, Chetti Putran, etc. Contribution of merchants to temples. Merchants constructed many temples, mandapas and donated sculptures and bronzes to existing temples. In Amur near Madurai, a Shiva temple in the name of Ayya Polil Iswaram was built during the reign of Maravarman Sundara Pandya I. The Valangir of Sri Lanka, Sekal Seva, Sevaka Tevan, installed the Lingodbhava sculpture and the Devi sculpture at the Arupukote Kur Kuralmani Iswaram temple during the reign of Maravarman Sundara Pandya. 
The donations of the Kodumbal or Manigrama merchants uh, and the cloth merchants of Irukandure have also be already been spoken about. The Nagaratar Irang, uh, Irukandure have uh, excavated a water tank. The Nagaratar of Radha Puram or Pusangudi had donated lands as Devardhana to the Shiva temple at Irukandure. The construction of enclosure walls was funded by two merchants, Arasakovan or Udayana Tengarai temple. At the Pranmalai Shiva temple, the sacred tank, the Matha, the Tirumadi Vilakam or the settlement for the temple served were all administered and protected by the Padinan Visayam at this place. This assembly Padinan Visayam collected levies from all merchandise and used it for temple expenses. At the Sengundrapuram Vishnu temple at Kerala, uh, Kerala Narayanam, a merchant from Malay Mandalam or Kerala donated money for the construction of the main entrance. A merchant from Nangur, a Muttarodian Devana, uh, Devanathan donated a Thira Athane Kal to the Metupatti Vishnu temple. During the period of Sundara Chola Pandya, a merchant Vemban Povan by the name of Vanavan Mahadevi Puram had donated 25 sheep to the temple of Kudal, uh, Kudalkudi Mahadeva. These are just a few of this aspect of the Pandya history and we surely deserve to know a lot more about them. I've just looked at the epigraphs today. Um, if you've... Uh, some part of my intention was also to overawe you with this list of donations. They are just numbers, they are just names. But I think the, the deeper sentiment is merchants or Devaradiyar or women were very, very clear that the more we give to the community, the more we share what we have to the community, the more good we are doing. I think that's the deeper sentiment that they had, which is why we see so many, and I've, I've left out a lot of them, but we see so many inscriptions because I think their way of wanting to be remembered was to be giving to the community. And I think in that way, there's a lesson for all of us, whether from the women of the Pandya country or the merchants of the Pandya country. Um, I'm very thankful for all of you to listen to me for so long. Um, I'm, not very, I'm not very conversant in reading out, but I thought it was important, given, given the importance and the augustness of this, uh, this occasion, I thought it should be a formal and a very deep uh, lecture like this rather than a more conversational aspect. Uh, and I think uh, by now you would agree that uh, we deserve to know the, the names and the deeds of these uh, women and these men. And like I said, everywhere we see lists of what they need to do. It is always about duty rather than rights. So it's about duty th than rights. It's about what can I do for the local community with the money that I have, with the knowledge that I have, with the arts that I have. And it's about putting the community over me, especially in times of great distress, which in the Pandya region was mostly during times of drought. So I think these are three lessons that are uh, uh, that are well applicable to our lives today. With those few words, I, I want to thank the Tamil Heritage Trust again for giving me this honor. And for all of you who have helped me in this journey, and I'm sure I can lean on you for my further support as well. Namaskaram. Thank you very much. Now we could take some uh, questions, uh, which I'm sh sure, sure people will be happy to answer. So if you have any questions, uh, please please uh, feel free to ask them or comments that you want to make. Sure, sure happy to. Yeah, yeah. And in the Chola country, they also engaged in warfare also. <laughs> so, yeah. I think uh, it looks like uh, in the top three cars, there was a lot of mobility. It looks like that. Thank you. Yes. Hmm. Um, 
from epigraphs which i don't see anything uh, i don't see I, there are there are inscriptions where land documents in uh, in palm leaves were eaten away by insects and the grant was reaffirmed in stone and copper that they have but this i am not sure i i have not come across to my knowledge but i would assume that given the sentiment of the hindu tradition i would assume that these gifts were made like the, the like the bronze deities for example right i think they were intended to always be in the temple and never leave the temple premises but uh, they were also aware that nothing in life is permanent and there will be changes also but this is only hypothetical uh, if you ask me for an inscription i don't have one well you <laughs> well but if you if you look at the old inscriptions um in, in our own tiruvallikeni as well it was quite okay for the temple to sell their land so in those days i think that they had that flexibility but uh, the transparency was very important i think thank you for bring i'm going to change the topic a little bit but any inscription that you see definitely in the pandya rain and probably in the chola as well whenever a decision had to be taken by the local community so for example giving land on auction or um, or for for cultivation or maybe even for a sale it would always be taken with all parties to that contract in present in that meeting and voting never so transparency was very very important yeah check check hmm i would assume so but we don't know the the nuances of the operation i would assume so but it does not take away from the temple's right to dispose of that land at a later point of time because we have inscriptions where temples have sold their lands because they had difficult i mentioned one devara dr who brought it back for the temple right so we've had that but that decision was taken not by one or two people in collusion it was a publicly transparent decision that was taken yes i think once you give the land to the temple doesn't it become the discretion of the temple to use it for whatever purpose because i can give it for like uh, a school or something under the uh, which has to be run under the temple but once it does become the temple then isn't it their discretion to use it for whatever purpose i can only say it, like, i can only say want. it appears so because we don't have any inscription that talks about what are the rules and regulations for the temple to administer its land only from decisions post mortem post facto can we do an analysis so <laughs> Yes. Thank you. Uh, mm. How important was slavery occurred in the wheel of economy? Just uh, because it doesn't come in the uh, inscriptions, can we assume they are a slave-free society? No, no, it comes in inscriptions. There are so this there is this myth that India never had slaves, which is not true at all. There was slavery. There is very much slavery, and they they were in the Devaradya, not in Pandya country, but I remember reading elsewhere that they were men and women slaves. So slaves were surely they were important. I we don't have an I don't have an epigraph to show you on on uh, merchants did not have slaves. I don't have an epigraph to show that they had slaves also. See, uh, we have to keep remembering when I am talking about epigraphs, when I am talking about the community, I am primarily talking only about the upper caste. i'm not talking about the dalits because their their traditions weren't recorded on epigraphs they may have had their own traditions of recording we've lost them for sure but i don't know so whatever i'm doing if for velalas we have a lot of information because the agricultural way we have sometimes we have dalit related communities mentioned in temple epigraphs there are cases where the temple land was uh, was given on rent to, to a to a um, uh, to a parekaram parayar it's mentioned sometimes so this was men, this was let alone for those parayar to do some agricultural work over there that context we have but otherwise their their relationships with the velalas or the brahmins don't have information yeah hmm aman arjun arko 
ஆமா அந்த மாதிரி அந்த குடிக்கிறது கல் இருக்குது அத தவிர அவளோட தேர செயல்களை எனக்கு தெரிஞ்சு இல்ல ஏனா நான் வந்து அந்த அந்த நடுகல்ல வந்து கல்வெட் இருந்தா தான் நான் அதை படிச்சிருப்பேன் இன் மை ஃபோகஸ் வாஸ் வெரி கிளியர் இட் வாஸ் ஆன் சோஷியல் ஸ்ட்ரக்சர் ஆஃப் தி பாண்டியாஸ் फ्रॉम தட் ஸ்டோன் இன்ஸ்கிரிப்ஷன்ஸ் சோ எனக்கு தெரிஞ்சு இல்ல யா ஷோ நாட் இன் தமிழ்நாடு பட் இன் கர்நாடகா யூ ஹேவ் வி ரீன் ஸ்பெசிஃபிக்கா வித் இமேजेस இருக்கு ஜஸ்ட் லாஸ்ட் வீக் वी ஹேட் a லெக்சர் பை கிருஷ்ணமூர்த்தி வேர் ஹி டாக் அபௌட் தட் அண்ட் இஸ் புக் So this is women warriors. Women warriors. Wow. Uh, but whatever you have as uh, men, it's there. Wow. Thank you, Badri. Um, my question is a bit of a follow-up to his. How eternal are these eternal lamps? And uh, is it like an unbroken tradition? Are some of these, whatever the money was given for, is that continuing in temples to this day? Oh, day certainly day? not. <laughs> I okay, don't think then. so. They're not. It's been a long time. And, and look, I mean, at the end of the day, we know this right everything is about shrishti sthiti and laya so there's a lot of creation stabilization dissolution temple fe- but temple festivals maybe many of the festivals that temples celebrate today the brahmotsav they are, many of them were created at an earlier point of time to end on the day of the king's birthday so those may still continue but i think practices have changed over a long period of time i mean you have to take it about the 1000 1500 years there have been so many riots so many droughts so many migrations it's even remarkable that these inscriptions themselves have survived <laughs> but uh, lamps well pudukote kudimiya mala and all some of these temples there are you can still see stone lamps it's very likely that they were from the old ones yeah i think we were a lot more open to things changing in those days than we are today yeah yes i know that there's probably no actual description of board games or anything in inscriptions but is there any reference to their entertainment or how they spent time ah no you won't because they will only be transactional records No, sorry. You can visit the temples and see the floors. You'll have a lot of game boards, but unfortunately, no. Yeah. It's very interesting that you have linked whatever you have said to inscriptions. When we talk about the women during the Pandya period, there must be parallel ways of looking at what kind of lives they had. Of course, we get only favor at the end. I have not done that study on this. It took me a long time to do this. <laughs> But that might be um, not only that, another interesting study that can be done from this is comparing all of whatever I said to the Chola country. So if you see there's a lot of connection between Kodumbalur and Madurai. It'll be interesting to look at this from both sides. There's so much work that's been done on the Chola systems of agriculture and water cons- and water management. but i think what tamil nadu really needs today is a proper study on how the pandyas did it because the cholas never bothered about water conservation because they had water all the time the pandyas and the pallavas were the ones who struggled with water pallavas there are very few inscriptions pandya there is some so we could do well with doing a bit of a deeper study on pandya water conservation rather than the chola or, or the pallava yeah yes sir what happened to the trade guilds when did they when did they fade out or something well we know that they existed till about the 13th 14th century but after that uh, malik kafur and and co i think it uh, every the system went into disarray 13th 14th century erku we know that they they existed in some form or the other yeah, yeah. that is a question of faith so it's oral uh, oral tradition it's a it's a story but we we know that the horse traders were there in uh, in pandya region and and their names are what manikvaska story also has that much we know there is actually one in i i think it's a 
it's a quote that i read long time back from an arab merchant and he says man these people from tamil nadu are you know from pandya region are such idiots they buy horses at such high value they feed it ghee and milk and curds and they kill the animal but it's good for us because we can sell them another one quickly <laughs> all words to that effect yeah hi hi pradeep hi yeah. hey hi yeah yeah, yeah hi. hi sorry uh, this is lakshmi uh, i just wanted to know about this devaradiyar <coughs> uh what about devadasis i mean like uh, you had devaradiyar so uh, are they kind of uh, like like devaradiyar is a devadasi the older term for devadasis were devaradiyar then they became devadasi so this devaradiyar are females yeah but though, though there are there were men in that community also they were they were adiyar adiyar would mean an honorific so it could be either gender Devar Adiyal would be a woman. Oh, because Devadasis were considered uh, like, you know, an outcast. Was it so? No, not at all. So all of what I said proves that they were not considered outcasts. They became outcasts only in the 1900s. No, especially when it became the female gender. I'm not talking no, no, about not it. at all. If you actually, if you look at though the inscription, though there are one or two inscriptions where we can see that there were some men in the Devar Adiyal community. Huh. All of them I talked about were actually women. yeah so very very imp- so number one to answer your question devadasis devaradi are the same devaradi are is the older tamil word devadasis came in much later devadasi would mean a woman devaradi are could be a man or a woman devaradi all could be a, ma- a woman only and the system was very much in they were very respected till about the 6th, 17th 18th century almost 18th century onwards there's a bit of a decline okay yeah. right right yeah. thank you thank, thank you, you. பெண்களுக்குரிய <laughs> <laughs> இல்ல நான் எதுவும் பண்ணல அளவுக்கு அந்த இருக்க கல்வெட்டுகள்ல இருக்க கல்வெட்டுகள்ல இருந்தது கல்வெட்டுகள்ல இருந்த செய்தியை நான் உங்களுக்கு சொல்லிட்டேன் அத தவிர காயின்ஸ் நான் பார்த்தது இல்ல மனோன்மணியம் சுந்தரார் யுனிவர்சிட்டில ஒருத்தர் வந்து தேவரடியார்னு ஒரு புக் எழுதி இருக்கார் அதுல பாண்டிய கல்வெட்டுகள் வச்சு நிறைய எழுதி இருக்கார் சோளாவும் எடுத்து எழுதி இருக்கார் அந்த புக்க நீங்க பாத்தீங்கன்னா அதுல ஏதாவது இருக்கலாம் எனக்கு தெரியாது Yes. This inscriptions of giving the donations and recording them for posterity. What was the intention? Was it to motivate others to follow suit or was it a record of things so that the temple knows what they have? Um, I can just have a call with you and tell you this. <laughs> but I have to send you an email. Uh-huh. Same reason. That's all. <laughs> Nothing has changed. We just, they put it on stone. There were, some of these inscriptions were also on copper plates. But the really important ones, like the Spiran Malay inscriptions, they're very important ones. So it had to go up on stone. And I think transparency also. Everybody could see it. It was recorded for life. <coughs> yeah. It was sort of chicken balance. I suppose so. I would think so. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. thank you very much uh, pradeep i think the uh, level of interaction after your talk uh, uh, signifies uh, how interesting it was and uh, how much people would like to know more about it and i hope your thesis and i'm sure the book that follows that uh, will will fill this gap in uh, knowledge about the pandya uh, especially in our in our uh, history at this stage uh, i'd like to thank a number of people uh, for making this uh, uh event uh uh a success as well as an interesting event so first of all i'd like to thank all of you for coming here uh, because uh, this is just the third event we are conducting in person after almost 2 years so uh, we are sort of slowly climbing back onto that thing of yeah why don't we just watch it on 
the uh, on the phone to hey let's go and meet some people so thank you very much for all of you uh, to all of you for coming here uh, i'd like to thank uh, of course all the nominees and the people who nominated them as you may know our process is that uh, uh, the 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 nominees can be nominated by anybody they can also nominate themselves and uh, we are happy to see the number of people have nominated people that they know uh, from across the country and i'd like to thank all of them for uh, taking the effort uh, we, have, we have written to all of them uh, uh, to also uh, to stay associated with us and uh, they can uh, they are all eligible to get nominated again uh, in the next round uh, of the award itself uh, i must especially thank uh, uh, mr shri maniam selvan uh he is the he, he has been very kind uh, with his time and uh, every year for the award he creates a little masterpiece uh, that is actually so the so the award that that pradeep will carry away today is, is a one off it's 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 not a copy that comes every year um, and we are entirely deeply grateful to um, uh, shri maniam selvan to for uh, taking the trouble and uh, Uh, and doing this every year for us so i'd like to really thank him for that um uh, of course uh, uh, ashwin mentioned the jury uh, all of them accepted almost immediately on our request dr kumud kanitkar uh, dr sanjay garg um, mr uday kumar who is himself doing such uh, fantastic work in bangalore and our very own shri kannan uh, we'd like to thank them for readily accepting this uh, little duty Uh, despite many of them having several other uh, engagements during this this time of the year and also spending a lot of time uh, taking it taking the whole process very seriously and selecting the winner so i'd like to thank them again um who else yes uh, of course i'd like to thank uh, rk sir for being closely uh, part of this process all the time uh, he was in fact part of the jury at in earlier editions and thank you very much uh, sir for your all your support uh from within the uh, thd community i'd like to thank of course uh, our inspiration uh, professor swaminathan for continuing to propel us and uh, and as um, ashwin mentioned challenges from time to time in terms of uh, what we want to do uh, uh, with with this movement uh, i'd like to thank uh, uh, ashwin for anchoring this entire process end to end uh thank you very much ashwin uh, and of course uh, vss ir who is not here uh, who again uh, uh, you know works on this as a as a masterpiece every year and and creates this uh, award and the entire citation and so on and so thank you uh, vss uh, for those of you who are uh, relatively new to tht uh, uh, we have these programs uh, now uh, twice a month uh in the first saturday it's an entirely online program and it's uh, it's in english by a speaker from anywhere in india uh, pradeep mentioned horse trading in south india uh, on 1st of october we have a program by uh, a talk by dr yashaswini chandra who has written the book on uh, the tale of the horse in india and so those of you who are interested in it do do watch it in our uh, youtube channel uh, she'll be speaking about uh, the history of how of the horse in south india uh, specifically Uh, uh on the third saturdays we meet here uh, where we have a a talk in tamil uh, on a more uh, local topic uh, uh, which may be of again of interest of course all our, all our talks are available on youtube for you to watch at leisure uh, but we'd like you to you know sort of come and encourage us by joining us here uh, at this uh, at this venue uh, every month So thank you very much uh, we look forward to having you again in one of our events thank you again